Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our fifth week of our virtual Bangor Main Stake Women's Conference. Um, I'd like to take a moment to put in a plug for uh, our upcoming event, our big finale, which is next Saturday, November 21st. And it will be a live broadcast. It'll be a Zoom broadcast. Um, it starts at 630 and we are so looking forward to it. Sister Beck from our New Hampshire Manchester mission will be speaking to us. And um, I'm sure it will be a really fun, wonderful time for us to unite as sisters in our stake. Um, I've been so inspired by the messages that have been given so far in Women's Conference. And uh, I really feel blessed by this ability we have to connect with each other while we are still apart. Um, before I get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Cindy Pierce, and to tell you a little bit about myself, my husband and I live in Madison and attend the Skowhegan Ward. Um, I was baptized at the age of 19 while attending the University of Maine in Farmington. Um, there I was taught by the missionaries and I gained a testimony of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. Soon after baptism, I transferred to Brigham Young University. I married in the Salt Lake Temple, um, raised four children, lived in Utah for 20 years, uh, struck through, struggled through a very difficult marriage and divorce, and subsequently returned to Maine with my four children. Um, Soon after returning home, I was reacquainted with a former classmate and introduced him to the gospel. He was baptized two months later before we were married. Um, actually, no, he was baptized two months before we were married. Our dating was about 10 months um, prior to that. Um, that wonderful man is Jim Pierce. We were later sealed in the Washington, D.C. temple. I had started teaching in a in elementary school while living in Utah and continued in Maine. Um, the majority of my time was as a fourth grade teacher. So if I make references to school, um, that's because it was my life for 30 plus years. Um, Jim and I have both recently retired and are transitioning now to a new set of life experiences. Um, the turns that life can take have been some of my greatest trials and most amazing of miracles. Um, today I want to uh, talk to you on a topic that affects us all in both positive and negative ways. I want to talk to you about how we evaluate others and ourselves, and most importantly ourselves. This Latter-day Saint um, journey that we are on has given us many blessings um, and some tools and unique perspectives to help us as we navigate through the hills and valleys of this journey called life. Um, but do we apply those tools? Uh, we've been given really awesome tools um, in the sessions previous to this, and I encourage you all to go back and listen if you haven't. Um, I've been truly inspired. Um, when I introduced myself to you, I chose to reveal a few superficial things about myself, but neglect to say anything about who I am as a person. I would like to submit to you um, that who you are and what you think of yourself can be two entirely different things. Um, some of you might be familiar with the series of children's books called The Magic School Bus. Uh, each book takes children on field trips, teaching them how things work by traveling inside of them. Um, and they go in in this amazing, magical yellow school bus. Well, today we are going to take a little field trip like the magic school bus, bus and attempt to go inside the human brain. This is going to be an interactive field trip, which means that you get to participate, not live, unfortunately, but through introspection. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to dig up old stuff from the past that you might have suppressed. I've got plenty of that stuff. Today, we're going to travel to the happy center of our brain. 
I went to Google and asked, what part of the brain controls emotions? I found a site called Healthline. The article was medically reviewed and updated on July 23rd, 2018, so I feel it's fairly reliable. From it, I learned the following, and I quote, the brain is a complex organ that researchers are still trying to decode, but experts have identified the limbic system as one of the main parts of the brain that controls basic emotions. The limbic system is a group of interconnected structures located deep within the brain. It's the part of the brain that's responsible for behavioral and emotional responses. The article defines happiness as an overall state of well-being or satisfaction. When you feel happy, you generally have positive thoughts and feelings. Imaging studies suggest that the happiness response originates partly in the limbic cortex. Another area called the precuneus also plays a role. The precuneus is involved in retrieving memories, maintaining your sense of self, and focusing your attention as you move about your environment. Experts think the precuneus processes certain information and converts it to feelings of happiness. For example, imagine you spent a wonderful night out with someone you care about. Going forward, when you recall this experience and others like it, you may experience a feeling of happiness." End quote. From this little bit of information, I begin to understand that we form our self-image or sense of who we are by experiences that we categorize using past similar experiences. Hold that thought while I jump to a devotional given at BYU by Kristen Matthews, an English professor there, titled, The Worth of Souls is Great. As part of one of her English assignments, she asked students to look for st standards used to determine value in pieces of literature. To get them started, she referred to a controversial Facebook page at the time called Hots and Knots as an example of how people are rated by others and asked her students to identify various markers or codes that could be used to rank others. Her students came up with the following list. What people wear, what cell phone they have, what laptop they use, what car they drive, what bands they listen to, what size their jeans are, what status their relationship is in, what apartment complex they live in, what films they watch, what facial hair they grow, and so on. She states, my students found that these things that seemingly describe, actually prescribe, certain behaviors and beliefs deemed important to acceptance and worth. I'll take a few extrapolations from her talk and she, and I quote, we have each placed a value on just about everything. The things that are most important to us get a higher value. We also place a value on ourselves. Where do we fit in on the great standard of measurement and who creates that standard? Is the standard the same for everyone? She continues, oftentimes we are unaware that we are ascribing worth to people in ways that contradict or challenge our professed beliefs as Christians. Wealth, physical appearance, education, sexuality, race, religious affiliation, and political party are just some categories that can be used to lift some folks up and bring others down. Where do these systems that evaluate worth come from? These systems are neither eternal nor transcendent, but are human creations. These human systems by which human beings have been evaluated, categorized, and ranked have changed with time and place. Obviously, these systems that elevate some and denigrate others are destructive and have been led to violence of a social and global scale. These false systems of value <coughs> also have a negative impact on a smaller scale on the individual and his or her sense of self-worth and place in the community. Being told that you are less, that you will never fit in or add up, or that you'll be accepted only when you change who you are is, a, is destructive emotionally, spiritually, and at times physically." End quote. 
So here are, here's the um, introspective part. I have a few questions I'd like you to think about. Ask yourself, how do I deal with all of these man-made standards and do they influence the image I have of myself and others? How does knowing that I am a child of God influence my sense of self-worth? President Dallin H. Oaks addressed this issue in his recent talk in General Conference titled, Love Your Enemies. In it, he states, and I quote, knowing that we are all children of God gives a divine vision of the worth of all others, end quote. Do we base our judgment on this knowledge? Now let's get back to the happiness part of the brain. Understanding that our brains will store happy times and attach familiar similar events to that emotion, it makes sense to me that we should do more of those things that bring us happiness. Possibly make a list of actions that when doing them make you feel good about yourself, give you a sense of confidence and well-being, bring you the most joy and peace and ultimately happiness. I've made such a list for myself, but have decided not to share it as these things are individual and personal. I am reminded that the Savior admonished us to be in the world, but not of the world. In the scriptures, we are told that the disciples of Christ will be thought of as peculiar people. I think every Latter-day Saint has felt a little out of step with their non-member peers. But is this necessarily a bad thing? Sister Sharon Eubank of the Gen Relief Society General Presidency gave a talk in the 2017 General Conference Women's Session titled, Turn On Your Light. Interestingly, she refers to a conference talk given 40 years earlier when Sister Camilla Irene Kimball read President Kimball's talk as he was ill at the time and not able to speak. And I quote, My dear sisters, may I suggest to you something that has not been said before, or at least in quite this way. Much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives, and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. To continue, among the real heroines in the world who will come into the church are women who are more concerned with being righteous than them with being selfish. These real heroines have true humility, which places a higher value on integrity than on visibility. Sister Eubank added, when we keep our covenants, it may make us different from others in our culture and society, but it gives us access to inspiration. So we can think of different solutions, different approaches, different applications. We aren't always going to fit in with the world, but being different in positive ways can be a lifeline to others who are struggling." End quote. And in Doctrine and Covenants 11, or 115.5, the Savior admonished us, Verily I say unto you all, Arise and shine forth, that thy light may be a standard for the nations. As a teacher, I had a front row seat in observing that being different can be especially difficult for children who are thrust into situations that they have little or no control over, such as school or unhealthy or an unhealthy home environment causing them to struggle with issues of self-esteem. Such children are thought of by professionals as being at risk. At risk for what, you might ask? At risk of failing, not just grade-wise, but socially and psychologically as well. As Latter-day Saint adults, we have special coping tools. We know we can draw upon the Savior and His infinite love for us. We have all of the promises prophets, apostles, and other church leaders given to us as we try to live righteously. We also have other options available to us that our children don't have, such as changing where we work or where we live. I was talking to a dear sister 
in our ward about this topic, and she told me of her experience growing up. She gave me permission to share it with you, and I quote, I was very shy as a child because of my having to wear glasses all the time. My parents loved me and provided me with the necessities of life, but didn't nurture my self-esteem, which caused even more shyness. I craved a acceptance, and as a result, I made some poor choices in my life. But thankfully, even though I believed in God but didn't know Him, didn't have a close relationship with Him, He was there to guide me and lead me to His gospel. I, it wasn't until I found the gospel and came to the knowledge that I was His daughter that my self-esteem started blossoming and growing." End quote. As parents, we want to raise resilient children who can withstand the darts that come from living in the world. Uh, Sister Rand spoke to this issue um, last week and had some very, very good points and talking points that we could have with our children. Um, raising resilient children comes by doing what we can to help them feel good about themselves. We know that teaching them the gospel of Jesus Christ gives them important tools such as an eternal perspective, the reassuring words of our Savior's love for them, the Holy Ghost to guide, comfort, and protect them. We want to teach them righteous principles that will lead to better choices and ultimately give them inner strength. By praising and building them up, doing fun things with them, creating traditions, giving them responsibilities that are within their ability to accomplish, we give them happy moments and self-confidence that will be stored in the happy part of their brains and where subsequent activities can be attached. It's food for thought, and a lot more could be said on that subject. I would like to share a couple of personal experiences about the human brain that I have discovered through personal trials. Um, I've dealt with headache pain, I think, since I was a teenager. I've lost days of my life lying in bed in a dark room trying to escape the pain. The only way laying in a dark room helps at all is that I'm able to rest and with any luck I'll fall asleep. My headaches are so frequent that if I had stayed home every time I had one, I would not have been able to hold down a job or a church calling. And living with this physical ailment, I have discovered something amazing about the human brain. I've noticed that distractions help a lot in curbing pain. It's like replacing the pain with something else. Over the years, even with migraine medication, I have dragged myself to many church activities, and when the activity was over, the headache would come pounding back. But during the activity, I was totally unaware of it. It's not a cure. It works only while the distraction is going on, but it has allowed me to live a fairly normal life. I've marveled at this phenomenon, and I've thanked my Heavenly Father many times for this major blessing in my life. One more personal example. Uh, recently, I had a mole removed from my face. I was amazed that my doctor did not use any numbing medicine. He simply rubbed the skin next to the area as he was doing it, and I felt absolutely no pain. So I researched it and found that the rubbing sensation distracts from pain by introducing a competing sensation that overrides pain signals. I'm so glad that Heavenly Father had the forethought to think of that defense mechanism when creating us. I wonder if that same principle works for emotional pain. And I believe that it does. When I take my mind off from my own issues and I, that I'm dealing with, and focus on something else, I forget my problems, if even for a short time. Some people turn to alcohol, computer games, television, etc. as a distraction from their troubles. Again, this is only a temporary fix. We know as sisters in the gospel that serving others is a great healing balm, taking our minds off from our own struggles. There are so many fringe benefits that come from serving others that don't come from other less worthwhile activities. And I would say that the best one is that you create a friendship. Your image of yourself also improves. With that 
improved self-image, you gain confidence and your ability increases. Also, it also broadens your perspective. Many times you learn a new skill because the person you are now friends with has talents that you may lack, so you learn from each other. President Russell M. Nelson taught, when, and this is quote, when sore trials come upon us, it's time to deepen our faith in God, to work hard, and to serve others. Then he will heal, heal our broken hearts. He will bestow upon us personal peace and comfort. Those great gifts will not be destroyed even by death. End quote. In this last general conference during the women's session, Christina B. Franco, second counselor in the primary general, general presidency, gave a talk titled The Healing Power of Jesus Christ. I will take some remarks from her talk. Quote, Having faith in Jesus Christ means relying on him, completely on him, trusting in his infinite power and love. It includes believing his teachings. It means believing that even though we do not understand all things, he does. As we come unto him, we can be filled with joy, peace, and consolation. All that is hard and challenging about life can be made bright through the atonement of Jesus Christ. He has counseled us, look unto me in every thought, doubt not, fear not. And in Matthew, the famous quote, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. This is a promise from God, giving us hope, faith in our Savior Jesus Christ, feeling his unconditional love for us, putting trust in the promises he makes to us. Another question to ask yourself, how has attendance to church affected my self-image? To quote Elder Cornish of the 70 in a talk titled, Am I good enough? Will I make it? He states, Sometimes when we attend church, we become discouraged even by sincere invitations to improve ourselves. We think silently, I can't do all these things, or I will never be as good as all these people. Please, my beloved brothers and sisters, we must stop comparing ourselves to others. We torture ourselves needlessly by competing and comparing. We falsely judge our self-worth by the things we do or don't have and by the opinions of others. If we must compare, let us compare how we were in the past to how we are today and even to how we want to be in the future. The only opinion of us that matters is what our Heavenly Father thinks of us. Please sincerely ask him what he thinks of you. He will love and correct but never discourages, discourage us. That is Satan's tool. End quote. And in a talk by President Uchtdorf titled, You Matter to Him, he gives this counsel. No matter where you live, no matter how humble your circumstances, how meager your employment, how limited your abilities, how ordinary your appearance, or how little your calling in the church may appear to you, you are not invisible to your Heavenly Father. He loves you. He knows your humble heart and your acts of love and kindness. Together they form a lasting testimony of your fidelity, fidelity and faith. Please understand that what you see and experience now is not what forever will be. And in 2 Corinthians 2.9 we read, But it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of man the things which God hath prepared for them who love him. The scriptures used, the scripture used as a theme for our conference, 2 Nephi 31 20, bears repeating. Wherefore, ye must press forward with steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope, and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, 
if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. What a great promise, promise filled with encouragement, giving us hope as we continue on this journey of ours. I'd like to close by introducing myself again. I am Cindy Pierce. I am a spirit daughter of a heavenly king. As such, I have a divine nature. I have infinite potential and am, and am of infinite worth. I have been blessed with unique talents that I am still developing. I have an inner strength that has been developed through trials, and I am just like you in all of these ways. Sisters, we are all sharing this life experience together. Our journeys are different, and as such, we have so much to learn from each other. May we see ourselves and others the way our Heavenly Father sees us, and understand our value, which is priceless. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.